Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 63. And as you've been studying with us, you know we're coming close, folks. We're in the home stretch. The finish line is approaching. Next Thursday night, we will finish our study. 66 chapters. It's only taken us a couple of years to get through this book. But we come this evening to, again, a section of scripture that I think has a lot of pertinence, a lot of relevance for the day in which we live. For if you were with us last time, you will recall how we saw that Jesus started his public ministry, really his first public speaking, his first sermon of sorts, if you will, by reading from the prophet Isaiah. And we noted last time, turning over to that passage in the Gospel of Luke, how Jesus read from Isaiah chapter 61. And as we start in our study this evening, hold your finger at chapter 63 and flip back to 61 with me, because I think it's important to see what Jesus read there. Beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah 61, almost word for word, he took up the scroll of Isaiah, and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and with that he set the scroll down and he said to the people today, in your hearing, I tell you that these words are fulfilled. And Jesus, of course, was taking the words of the prophet Isaiah and applying them to himself, declaring himself, presenting himself as that promised Messiah of God, the Savior of the world. But you'll note that he stopped at a rather interesting point in that verse, verse 2 there. For he stopped not at a period, but rather at a comma. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he stopped and set the scroll down. Some have said, as I shared last Thursday evening, that that comma is the longest comma in the world. For it's lasted now the span of some 2,000 years. For the words that follow that comma are words that more appropriately apply to his second coming or his coming again. And it's those words that we want to give thought to this evening as you turn back to chapter 63 for the rest of that sentence says, and the day of vengeance of our God. For you see, as chapter 61 and 62 we're talking about restoration, you have to understand that before the restoration comes, tribulation and judgment will precede. And that is exactly what we're going to read about here in the chapters before us tonight. Join with me, please, beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah 63, where we read, Who is this who comes from Edom, with dyed garments from Bozrah, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Now, here's the answer to that question. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red, and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And here's the answer, verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger, and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. Now again, I'm going to ask you to hold your finger there in chapter 63 and flip all the way to the end of your Bible. Revelation chapter 19. 
for before we really begin to consider these words of the prophet Isaiah, I want us to look now at a parallel description over in the New Testament, really, of what is being described here in Isaiah 63. Here in Isaiah 63, we see a description of the second coming of Jesus, his coming again to judge um, the world and to establish his kingdom. And look at how it is viewed thousands of years, hundreds of years later, I should say, by, by John as he's banished to the island of Patmos in Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, he writes, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Catch this. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Sound familiar? We just read that in Isaiah 63. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Who is that, saints? Yeah, that's you and me. You can pencil in your margin there, me. You may not be an equestrian kind of person. You may have never ridden a pony in your life, but in that day, you're going to ride and you're not going to fall off. You know, I, I grew up around horses, and I hate horses um, because I grew up around them. My sister had the job of feeding them. I had the other job, yes, cleaning up what was left after you fed them. But I had a horse, and I tried to ride him a couple of times, and he bucked me off, and I didn't particularly like him. His name was Snoopy, and we ended up selling him to the horse auction, which I understand, and you horse lovers in the crowd aren't going to like that, but your pet food probably was made out of him. Um, but seriously, there's coming a day when we are all going to be riding horses, coming with Jesus and his glorious appearing here. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress, another familiar imagery from what we just read in Isaiah 63. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, folks, what we read here in Revelation 19 parallels what the prophet is describing in Isaiah 63. And note the similarities. Again, treading of the wine press and catch this, the wearing of garments dipped in blood. And you might think that the blood that is being spoken of here, as I have heard taught many times in this passage, is speaking of the blood of the saints, the blood of those martyrs who had laid down their lives for the faith during that tribulation period for Jesus Christ. And yet, as you flip back now with me to Isaiah 63, we see how in verse 3 of Isaiah 63, that's not so at all. But the blood that is stained upon his garments is actually the blood of his enemies. Those that he has come to judge. In fact, someone has well said that either his blood will cleanse you of your sins, or your blood will stain his garments. And we see that that's what's happening here. As the prophet asks the question, who is this who come from Eden? Who would dyed garments from Bozrah? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Well, the Lord answers that question. He says, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And I like that, folks. Don't miss that. As Isaiah is speaking about the coming of Christ and his judgment is coming, God reminds us of his character, of his very nature. And that is that he is mighty to save. For you read over and over again in the scriptures how when God's judgment comes, people are still being saved. And when you read of some of the last judgments of God during the tribulation period upon this earth, still people are being saved. Because God is able to save people even in the midst of judgment. And that's what he's trying to communicate here in these verses. Why is your apparel red, your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, note that. And from the peoples, no one was with me. 
For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. He's trodden the winepress alone. Nobody has joined him in this because, listen, judgment belongs to Jesus alone. He said so over in the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and verse 22. He told us there how all judgment has been delivered to the Son. Jesus Christ is the judge and the only judge. And it's important for us to understand that. Because people aren't going to give an account to you, and they're not going to give an account to me. But they are going to answer to God. And we need to remember that, folks. Because sometimes as Christians, we are accused of being a judgmental. And don't misunderstand me. I think that there are things that we are to judge. There are things that we are to discern. I think doctrine. I think teaching. Is it biblical? Is it unbiblical? Does it line up with the scriptures? Is it of God or not? We're told in the scripture to prove all things, to hold fast to that which is good. We're told in Acts 17.11 that we're to search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. There are things that we are to judge. But listen, I don't believe we are to judge people. We're not to judge people because listen to these words found over in Romans chapter 14 and verse 4 where the Apostle Paul writes, Who are you to judge another man's servants? To his own master he stands or falls. Who are you to judge another man's servant? You see, we're reminded here that Jesus alone is going to be the judge. Nobody's going to be judging with him, and nobody's going to be standing with him in judgment. But he alone, all judgment has been given to him. And when we realize that, folks, and when we truly grasp that understanding, it frees us up to do what God has told us in his word to do, and that is to love. You see, I can love people now because even if they're messing up and if they're blowing it and they're off the wall, I know that someday they're going to talk to God about that and I really don't have to worry about it because I'm not their judge anyway. And so I can do what the scripture tells me to do and that's to love one another even as he loves us. And we've spoken about that even recently on Sunday morning here. Going on, verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. And you know, those are some hard words to swallow coming from Jesus, wouldn't you say? The day of vengeance? I mean, we kind of have this imagery in our mind of what, what some have described as the Sunday school Jesus. You know, the guy with the flowing locks and the, and, and the beautiful eyes with the, with the woolly lamb around his neck, you know, and a smile on his face. And I mean, he looks so pleasant. It looks like the guy that, that you'd want to move in next door, have over for dinner. And yet here we're told that vengeance fills his heart. Because while it's true, Jesus came as that good shepherd and that lamb of God. He's coming again as judge. He's coming again to set things in order. He's coming again to right every wrong. And so we read here how the, the day of vengeance is in his heart. The year of my redeemed has come. I looked. But there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation for me. and my own fury it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger. And made them drunk in my fury. And brought them down. And brought down their strength to the earth. Verse 7. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. And the praises of the Lord. According to all that the Lord has bestowed to us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. And so he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But 
they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit so he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them and really in the space of about five verses there you have a synopsis of their history you have a summary of their history the prophet is recollecting he's remembering how God had been incredibly good to the people he had blessed them with his loving kindness his very presence he bestowed upon them every good and spiritual blessing and, and ultimately became their savior and how did they respond but verse 10 says that they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit so he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them and that is exactly where they find themselves in this day Isaiah's writing it's a day where judgment loomed in their future it's a day where the clouds of darkness were surrounding them he thinks back to some some of the earlier history of, of, of the nation and, and how God was so good to them and so so kind and wonderful to them he speaks about his his goodness towards them there in verse 7 um, his mercies being bestowed upon them his loving kindness he says in verse 8 surely they are my people children who will not lie so he became their savior note this verse 9 in all their affliction he was afflicted you know what that means God felt their pain he felt their sorrow when they were going through something he was going through it with them and I don't know about you but that is a wonderful thing about our father he is not some impersonal distant God but he's personal and he experiences what you and I are going through he hurts when you hurt he feels the afflictions when you're afflicted in fact the writer of Hebrews put it this way he says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who was in all points tempted as we are and yet without sin the point being is he can relate he can understand and therefore he can show compassion and mercy and kindness because when we're hurting he's hurting and I find great comfort and refuge in that because we serve a personal God one who isn't distant and doesn't care about what you and I are going through in fact as they are being afflicted we read in verse 9 how and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and his pity he redeemed them and I hope the word their angel in your Bible is capitalized because it's the same word that's used for the angel of the Lord which is none other than Jesus Christ himself this is what some would describe as a Christophany a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ the angel of his presence saved them and in his love and his pity he redeemed them he bore them and carried them all the days of old but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit so that he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them now folks here is where it gets a little close to home like Israel we too have experienced the goodness of God we too have experienced the bounty of his blessing we have experienced his loving kindness his goodness his grace his mercy he has we sing the song God shed his grace on thee America and he has and like they how have we responded how have we repaid him but just like what we read in verse 10 here they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit I am very concerned about what's going on in our country today as I'm sure you are too I got to once again I'm going to avoid the temptation for the soapbox derby here tonight but I have to applaud the President of the United States okay in an election year he took a most unpopular stand in declaring 
that marriage must be monogamous between a man and a woman and he supports a constitutional amendment for such. Now you don't do that and expect to gain the votes of the liberal crowd in an election year by making such a stand. The mayor of San Francisco is probably not going to vote for George Bush. But again, I applaud him for taking that stand because as we've seen him do again and again in this administration, he's taken a stand for morality and he's taken a stand, I believe, for what's right in the sight of God. He pushed that partial birth abortion ban and we now have it through Congress. We see now his proposal for a congressional amendment to define and to enforce what marriage is. And as this country over the last several decades has wandered farther and farther away from God, I don't have my hope in a politician in Washington and don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I have a hope that even in these dark hours in America, God's light is shining and that he is doing something. And of course, you're well aware of the, the movie that has now been released, opening yesterday, Christians flocking by the scores to it. And who knows what the fruit of that is going to be. I talked to a brother up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho yesterday and again today, and, and they're seeing theaters packed out, and that's a marvelous report. And churches are seizing the opportunity to follow up with the report that Jesus did it all for you. And when you see that in such graphic depiction on the screen, how can you walk away and not realize that it was your sin and my sin to put him through that? You may be aware that the hand that nailed the spike of that actor in the movie to the cross was none other than the hand of Mel Gibson. He was trying to communicate a message there. And that message wasn't anti-Semitism or any of the other things that he's being accused of. But the message is that my sin and your sin put him on that cross. And so folks, as I've shared before around this place, I don't think the Church of Jesus Christ is going to leave this earth some weak, anemic puppy. I think we are going home in a blaze of glory. And I think we're beginning to maybe see some things that are starting to light the fire. I'm excited about what I see going on. You know, I'm excited about the, the adversity that we find uh, against our faith. I'm excited about some of what's going on in, in cities and, and legislatures around this country of ours because I realized that more and more Jesus said that his coming is going to be like in the days of Noah and I mean how bad were they you know I look at Sodom and Gomorrah which he described as well and I'm thinking Lord we still haven't gotten there yet I guess not because he hasn't come yet and yet still awesome and exciting things going on in the kingdom but I am concerned that like he is describing Israel of old here Despite God's goodness, his blessing, they rebelled, they grieved his spirit, and so the Lord himself turned against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Quickly, verse 11. Then he, speaking of the prophets, speaking of the people, then he remembered the days of old, the good old days. You know, they actually publish magazines now reminiscing about that. I was waiting in the doctor's office the other day with my wife and actually picked one up and that's all it was about. You know, the old black and white photos of the milkman delivering milk on the porch. I remember that as a kid. You know, that's what they did back in those days, you know, and the, the, the old radio that took like 15, 20 minutes to warm up as the tubes would, would glow inside. And I mean, people look at that. I remember changing tubes on my dad's television set. Remember that? You'd have to go down to the electronics store and you'd have to match the tube up with the right tube behind the, you know. Most people don't even know, know what a TV with a tube is like. I mean, and if you got one, it's probably worth hundreds of dollars as an antique today. But the prophet is, is kind of getting a little reminiscent here. He says, then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people 
saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they might not stumble, as a beast goes down into the valley and the Spirit of the Lord causes them to rest, so you led your people to make yourself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, verse 15 continues, and see from your habitation, holy and glorious, where are your zeal and your strength, the yearning of your heart and your mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless you are our father. Though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from everlasting is your name. O oh Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and hardened our heart from your fear? Return for your servants' sake, the tribes of your inheritance. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled, those who were never called. By your name. Now don't miss what's happening here, folks, because this is fascinating. Back in verse 11, we begin to see how the prophet waxes sentimental here. He begins to remember the olden days. He begins to remember those days when God was moving and ministering mightily in their midst. Those days when Moses stepped up to the to the to the um, the Red Sea there, and the water was parted, and Israel crossed on dry land. Those days when they were being led in the wilderness by a pillar of fire at night, a cloud by day. Those days when God was supernaturally feeding millions of people there in the wilderness by manna and then quail. He's remembering the marvelous, mighty ministry of God in the days of old. And you read in the subsequent verses how he's lamenting that those days are no longer so. You see, these were the good old days, but it's not happening at this time in Israel's history. And the prophet is missing them. And yes, he's even longing for them. Because something has happened. And if we're not careful, it can happen in our lives too. In fact, it's been well said that if there's a time in your past when you have seen God move and minister more mightily and greatly in your life than he's doing now, ask yourself, who moved? You see, that's what's happening here. God was seen to do great and mighty things in the nation, but not now. No ju judgment and darkness is looming in their future. And so the prophet is missing that. He's kind of going sentimental over that. And that can happen in your life and mine. Because distance can set into our relationship with God. We move, not Him. And the result is, we lose that sense of nearness and closeness with God. That's what he's desiring. That's what he's longing for. And yet he realizes that something has, has created a gap. Something has created a distance here. And so he says in verse 15, look down from heaven. And see from your holy habita or your habitation, holy and glorious, where are your zeal and your strength, the yearning of your heart and your mercies toward me? Are they restrained? It's like, God, what's up? I don't sense you as, as, as close to me as you once were. Are, are you holding back? Are you keeping something from me? And have you ever felt that way? Have you wondered that maybe, Lord, I, I, I know you're there, but are you really? I'm not sure. I, I don't sense your presence in my life like I used to. You know, if, if some distance has grown in your relationship with God, if you're, if you're sensing a little chill, a little bit of coldness setting in there, remember this, verse 16. Doubtless, you are our father. Though Abraham was ignorant of us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O oh Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. Even though you may feel distant from God, 
Know this. He's still your father. Others may deny you. Abraham doesn't know you. Israel doesn't recognize you. Want to have no part. But God is still your father. Even in those times when you sense some distance in the relationship, the beauty is he doesn't put you up for adoption. <laughs> He's still your papa. You know, and I, I mean, those of you with teenagers here tonight can relate. There may have been a time when you would have really liked to have rented your teenager out. Maybe even given them away. Put him down on the corner like people put their used sofa or refrigerator. Free. You know, just pick them up, take them with you, get rid of them, okay? Free. No. They're still yours. And you're still their papa. And that's true of God. Though you may wander, though you may stray, Though you may cool off in your relationship with him, he's still your God and he's still your dad. But don't be like them. When you go through those, those cool spells, when you kind of go through those spiritually dry places, don't pull on God what they try to pull on God here in verse 17. Watch this. Oh Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways? And hardened our heart from your fear. You see who they're putting the blame on? God. I'm like this because you made me like this. It's your fault, God, that I've backslid. It's your fault, God, that I've become cold in my faith. It's your fault, God, that I've got distance in our relationship. Watch out. Because I have observed our human nature is such that we can rationalize and justify even the most incredible things. And we can somehow make it sound like it's somebody else's fault. And here, what they're trying to do is say, God, why did you do this to me? It's not my fault. It's your fault. And we live in a society of fault finders. Have you noticed that? People pointing fingers and blaming others for their fault, for their problem. So much so that one person put it in poetry form and listen to what they say this is good I went to my psychiatrist to be psychoanalyzed to find out why I killed my cat and blackened my wife's eyes he put me on a downy couch to see what he could find and this is what he dredged up from my subconscious mind when I was one my mommy hid my dolly in the trunk and so it naturally follows that I would always be drunk when I was two I saw my father kiss the maid one day and that is why I suffer now from kleptomania Kleptomaniacs. When I was three, I suffered from ambivalence towards my brothers, so it follows naturally that I would poison all my lovers. I'm so glad that I have learned the lesson it has taught, that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. That is the mindset we live in today. It's always somebody else's fault. And if you ever dealt with somebody that was always turning the tables on you, to make it seem like it was your fault and not their fault. That's what these people are doing. But look at who they're trying to pull it on. They're trying to pull it on God. Don't be like them, okay? When you go through those spiritually dry times, when there may be a little bit of a chill or a coldness set into your spirit, know first of all that God is still your Father and He hasn't moved. He is still compassionate, gracious, and kind. But you have. And you've got to get yourself back in line with where the Lord would have you. And so continuing on, verse 18 and on into the next chapter. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled. Those who were never called by your name. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. That you would come down that the mountains might shake at your presence as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. And I'm sure they're thinking back to the days of Moses there on Sinai. For since the beginning of the world, 
men have not heard nor perceived by the ear nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness who remembers you in your ways you are indeed angry for we have sinned in these ways we continue and we need to be saved whoa a turning point in Israel's history here but again going back to verse 1 of chapter 64 as the prophet is, is waxing reminiscent as he's, as he's being sentimental as he's remembering back to the good old days and how God moved and ministered in their midst and it's just not happening now he realizes that Lord we need help we need you and so he cries out in verse 1 oh that the heavens would, would that you would rent the heavens that you would, would, would open the heavens that you would tear them open and that you would come down for you see the prophet knew that what was needed most at this moment in Israel's history was revival they needed a breakthrough from God they needed God to come out of heaven and into the hearts of people that had turned away from him in fact it was Warren Wiersbe who says that this is one of the greatest revival prayers found in the Bible that's what's happening here the prophet is crying out that God would come down and we certainly know that he did didn't he and the word became flesh and dwelt among us God did this but you know what he's about to do it again I believe that Jesus is coming soon and so we see how he cries out for the the heavens to be open for the Lord to come down and folks I really believe that that is the answer that is needed so urgently in the world today the United Nations isn't going to produce peace the military might of the only remaining superpower the US of A isn't going to produce peace there is only one peace producer and he's described as such in the scripture his name is the Prince of Peace and how we need him to come down even as the prophet is crying out here in these verses as he comes down you remember how he did there with Moses on the top of Mount Sinai the mountains quake that the nations may tremble at your presence you did awesome things for which we did not look you came down the mountains shook at your presence for since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear nor has the eye seen any God besides you note this who acts for the one who waits for him Whoa. what the prophet is saying first of all is nobody has seen a God like you they may carve images they may mold idols they may fashion and form these little brass squatty figures they may make a God with nose and eyes and ears and after themselves but they don't know a God like you you transcend any created being you transcend anything that man can form or fashion with his hands eye is not seen ear is not heard you may be aware of the fact that Paul kind of caps off of this phrase or coins off of this phrase over in the Corinthian letter when he says that eye has not seen and ear has not heard that which God has prepared for those who love him and it's believed that he took some of his inspiration right here from these verses as he declared such but notice this about our God he is a God who acts for the one who waits for him have you ever found yourself waiting on the Lord how do you usually do it your fingers your foot your patient you know where are you God you know I mean it's like I prayed five times about this already and, and you haven't answered me yet and I mean waiting on the Lord has got to be one of the most challenging things for us especially in this country because you've heard my sermon on waiting before I'm not gonna bore you with it all again but we are an instant minded society aren't we I fix my instant oatmeal I have my instant coffee I mean I drive through McDonald's to get my instant breakfast and I mean everything is ha right there right now and if you have to wait I mean the other day I had to wait in line at Walmart 
you know and then the cashier did that oh that dreaded thing when they reached over and pulled that cord for their light you know what that means don't you trouble at the register either the customer you know needs their check approved or they don't have an item on, on their database that scans with the price something and I'm sitting there like great Scott you know now it wouldn't have been so bad other than the fact that I had been in a line previous to that that wasn't moving very well and it seemed like this line was moving better so I, I hopped out and as I I'm standing there watching this light flash I realized the customer behind which I was standing in the other line was now long gone <laughs> and I'm thinking Lord are you trying to teach me something wait you see he is the God who answers he is the God who acts for those who wait on him and what I often do, and I'm sure none of you in this room are guilty of that, is, is in my impatience, rather than waiting on the Lord, I sometimes try to take matters into my own hands. It's like, God, I've given you 20 minutes to fix this, and now I'm going to do it since you seem to be taking a coffee break, you know? You're just not listening up this morning, and I've cried out to you about this, and you haven't answered me, so here goes! And usually when I make a complicated mess out of things, I end up coming back to the Lord broken and repentant. And you know what? Still waiting. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Does God have a sense of humor or what? You know, in your impatience, you try to fix it yourself only to realize that now you've made a mess of things. And so now there's something else you've got to wait on God to fix for you. Because before there was just one, but now that you tried to do it, now there's two. And you learn, hopefully, before you multiply that to three or four, you just back off and say, okay, Lord, I'll be patient. I'll wait. But he's a God who acts. That's his promise, folks. He isn't snoozing. He isn't napping. He isn't sleeping. If you find yourself in the waiting room of God, it's because he's trying to work some virtue, some attribute, some character into your life. He isn't tormenting you. He isn't torturing you. He isn't punishing you. Now, it is true, and we've read this in the prophet, and we'll see this again future, that if there is sin in your life, that poses an obstacle to God answering your prayers. You may be waiting simply because there's something in the way between you and him that needs to get cleansed and needs to get out of the way. But if that isn't the case and you find yourself waiting on God, it may be that he is trying to work out some attribute in your life. And oh, how he knows in our society that attribute desperately is one of patience. How we need to be people of patience. As Rusty and I traveled in Turkey a couple of weeks ago, you know, the only place that people were really rude and impatient was at the airport. Every place else, man, it was kind of slow going, take your time, no hurry. Did you notice that? I mean, the church service meets at 10. But, you know, folks are still showing up at 10, 15, 10, 20. No problem. Because they're there until 8 o'clock at night. Church is all day. And so you don't have to start right at 10. And I mean, that's just the way, you know, you go on to some of the reservations around us. And these folks aren't in a hurry. They just take their time. And you know what's fascinating about that is most of these people don't have high blood pressure and very few of them die of heart attacks. And there's something about that stress that causes that in our high pressure, pressure cooker kind of society. And we would do well to learn this attribute, this virtue of God in patience. And quite often the only way it's worked out in our life is making us wait. Wait on the Lord quickly. We're about out of time here tonight. Verse 5. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. You know, that's a monumental statement there. To get someone to confess their sin, wow. I mean, there are a lot of people today that that is the number one thing that keeps them from God. Is they are unwilling to confess that they're sinners. They're unwilling to say, Lord, I've blown it. My life's a mess. I messed up. And I need your forgiveness. But these people realize that it's because of their sin. And not only that, but they realize they need to be saved. You know, that sounds like the gospel message right there in verse 5, doesn't it? 
They confess their sins and they cry out to be saved. I mean, what more is there? That, that, is, and that is the message of the gospel right there. Confess your sins <laughs> and acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior. But we are all like an unclean thing. We all are like an unclean thing. You know what that means? You're not an exception. And all our righteousness is like filthy rags. And uh, you know what that means. I don't have to expound on that, I hope, here tonight. We all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. You see, these guys are realizing that the best they have to offer God falls way short of what God requires. Their righteousness is polluted. It's filthy. It's dirty. And I can't help but think of the words of Charles Spurgeon who said, Brethren, if our righteousness is so bad, what must our unrighteousness be? Think about it. Well, if our good is filthy rags, <laughs> what's our bad like? Oh, Lord. Sewer water? I don't know. I mean, pretty. Uh. But really, there isn't an exception in this room. Not a one of us. We're all an unclean thing. The best we have to offer God, our good deeds and the best that we could do is filthy and falls way short. And there's no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. See, as I've shared in messages before, you didn't find God. He found you. You, you were the lost one. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. That's what will separate God from you, is your sin. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. Have we heard that before in tonight's study? In the space of two chapters now, this is the second time the prophet's reminding God who he is. You think God forgot? <laughs> I think it was for the people's benefit. You are our father. He, he, he's saying, okay, God, you're dad. Yeah, and you know, I think he's doing that because he's appealing to God in his compassionate, gracious, and merciful nature. I think of David when he fell into sin there and numbering the people. Remember God visited him and said, David, something's going to have to be done about this. And so he gave David a, a multiple choice discipline. Remember that? And he told David, you know, you, you pick how, how this is going to spell out here, but I'm giving you a choice, A, B, or C. And David opted for the right one, in my opinion. And that is that he placed himself in the hands of God. For I believe that David knew that God's nature, even though he was going to have to judge David's sin, and the consequences of that sin was still merciful, gracious, and compassionate. And so I think that's why the prophet is reminding the people and us, he's our father. You are our father, we are the clay, and you are potter. And all we are, and all we are the works of your hand. Another imagery there that is used pretty frequently in the scripture. He's the potter, we're the clay. And of course over in Jeremiah and elsewhere in the Old Testament, the prophet speaks out, and what are we doing as the clay? Telling God what to do with our life. You see, God is molding us. God is shaping us. God is fashioning us. And are you on that potter's wheel tonight saying, God, stop it. I don't like what you're making me. I don't want to be a missionary. I want to be a janitor. I don't want to be a janitor. I want to be a preacher. God, will you stop touching me that way? It hurts. Will you stop fashioning me like that? I don't want to be a bowl. I want to be an ashtray. No, I don't want to be an ashtray. I want to be a teapot. You know, and I mean, really, we laugh at that, but, but I hear that all the time. I hear that from Christians all the time. God is putting the thumb and the finger of his hand in their life, fashioning them and working, and they're like, no, I don't like what God's doing in my life right now. I wish he would stop. And, and, and we murmur and we whine and we complain. And we begin, to, we begin to, to challenge the potter. And the point being, we're the clay. 
in the words of Jeremiah, we'll get there soon. What business do we have questioning the potter, what he's doing in our life? We are the clay. You are our potter. And all we are, the works of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look. We all are your people. Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you, it's burned up with fire. And all our pleasant things are laid waste. God, wake up. Look at this mess. The cities are burned. The houses are ra ravaged. The temple is destroyed. Where were you when all this was going on? Will you take notice, Lord? Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O oh Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us very severely? God, are you ever going to do anything about this? Is what they're asking. And you'll have to come back next week to find out the answer to that as we close the book of Isaiah. Let's pray.